this week on the show. I'm in Oslo, playing the Norwegians at their own game. I'm speeding so fast. <laughs> we check out some medieval sat-nav by studying an 800-year-old map of the world up close. And Lucy takes a bumpy ride to test out two new cameras that could add that professional touch to your travel videos. But first, I'm in the Norwegian capital of Oslo because I've heard that beyond the tourist trail of the fjords and the Vikings, an unlikely trend is taking hold, all based on one of the world's most enduring games. In chess tournaments, sometimes a match can take two whole weeks. And here in Norway, it's entertainment. This is a really old game, not anything that's brand new. So why is it coming back here in Norway? First of all, because we have a really good chess player here in our country. It wasn't before Magnus became the best that it exploded. World number one Magnus Carlsen was a chess prodigy, first reaching the top of the rankings in 2010. He has dominated the game ever since, and still holding the crown at just 28 years old, it's only Kasparov who has held the top spot for longer. By official ratings, he is the greatest player the world has ever seen. I would say my favorite player from the past is probably myself like three, four years ago. But it's not all been about Magnus. Chess fever has spread here thanks to modern tech and major coverage on TV and online. It's a show. We have celebrities in the studio. We have a good uh, vibe. One, two, three, and to the four, Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre is at your door. It's the whole package. At this point, I should say that this unshakable grandmaster has agreed to make a rare media appearance outside of tournaments. To meet me, and he's expecting a game of chess. Well, I have a one-on-one, head-to-head face-off with Magnus coming up very shortly. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic. My strategy is have no strategy. He can't, he can't read this face yeah. if, there's no, if there's no strategy underneath. The bad thing for you is that is also often his strategy. So, I'd better get practicing. Ben. Hi. Hey. Nice to see you. I'm here to scrape off the rust. Wonderful. <laughs> Magnus will be shaking his boots. I hope so. At Sternen Chess Club, weekly tournaments have members compete in the latest trend, rapid chess. With the time limit being just 10 minutes, it's become more popular with, with, with rapid chess and blitz chess. You get more games, there's more action. Yeah. Uh, and there's also uh, more mistakes. Uh, like the one you did now. <laughs> <laughs> Try to uh, um, gain control of the center. If you see the board now... You uh, are in control of the center. I can say that <laughs> because I have two points in the center. Uh, if you try to occupy the center, or at least if you do like this, mm -hmm. your, you see, your, 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 your bishop is attacking all the way down to my king. Ah, uh, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. So if you want to just keep on doing moves for me, then uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll win. <laughs> if you're playing Magnus, I would suggest to try to attack as soon as possible. Uh -huh. Because if he gets to attack, you lose. <laughs> I, think, I think it's going to be inevitable, but either way. Yeah. Well, people keep on filing in here, so it seems like it's very soon to competition time. Yeah. And let's just forget about this game. <laughs> let's do and also it. we'll start from scratch. <laughs>
Anyone can join the weekly tournament here, and everyone plays five games. Even me. <laughs> the game's about to start. There it is. I'm already late. Here's my spot. Have some coffee. And the game's on. My first time playing timed chess, actually. And um, it's not going well. <laughs> even though I lost. The club has seen its membership nearly double since Magnus came on the scene. Got us clean. Ouch. Ouch. Good game. That yeah, was a good game. Out of five, we won one, but I had a, a, a plan, a strategy that was molded over the course of five games. Ben helped me, and by the end of it, I kind of felt somewhat confident. So I'm gonna take that strategy, bring it tomorrow to the world champion, and if I last six turns, that's a win for me. So I'm gonna go back home, rest the biggest muscle in my brain, or the most important one, and get ready for the match. But get out of the chess clubs, and people are playing chess everywhere, online and on their smartphones. I've arranged to meet Magnus where they develop his three apps. They've had over five million downloads. Hey, I'm here for Magnus. Is this the right place? Yeah. It is? Okay, great. Not exactly sure where to go. Ah, by the chessboard. Good place to find Magnus. In this day and age, there's probably a million different games all competing for the spotlight. But here in Norway, chess seems to be in the front lines. Do you think that your influence on the game has had a, a long-term impact on the culture of this country? Um, well, I would like to say that it's, it's mostly about the game. That, that, is, that is great. And uh, if I've played a role in, in sort of um, leading uh, people towards realizing that, then I'm very happy about it. Mm -hmm. It is a part of culture in uh, in so many countries. It's it's truly a global game, so mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. We have a timer here, and I played my first game of time chess last night. But what are we playing today? I will have 30 seconds, and you will have uh, three minutes. So uh, I don't know about your, your level, but I'm guessing the main challenge here is going to be the time. I, would, <laughs> I think so. And so you go first? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. How many seconds was that? Well, uh, it was about 20, but... So you, you only used 15 seconds of your time? Um, yeah, well, a little bit less, because the clock ran a bit before I stopped it. But, uh... <laughs> well, maybe chess isn't your game, and that's totally fine. There's lots of ways you can travel the world and have fun. And here's our travel show list of tips for you. Why don't you try your hand or foot at Sipak de Kra or kick volleyball? Dating back to the 15th century, you can find locals playing this popular Southeast Asian sport in Bangkok's public parks, city streets, and even in temple courtyards. This game is fast-paced and wildly entertaining, with the players displaying an impressive level of speed, agility, and even acrobatic skill. If you're traveling alone or have never been one for team sports and you're in Japan, then give Pachinko a go. You'll need plenty of skill to play this old school mechanical arcade game and it's something of a national obsession. 
Though gambling is prohibited in Japan, you can bypass these laws by swapping your winnings for tokens, which in turn can then be exchanged for cash. Although it's not likely to be declared an Olympic sport anytime soon, this annual bog snorkeling event takes place in Wales and involves competitors from all around the world, donning their most imaginative outfits and snorkeling 60 meters through a peaty, <laughs> murky bog. Warmer and drier spectators can watch from the bank of the trench, accompanied by live music and local ale. And Petanque or boule, as it's often known, is a game so steeped in French culture that seemingly every town has a sandy boulodrome at its center. A social focal point for locals, the game involves throwing a large metal ball at a smaller metal ball while trying to fend off your opponent. And travelers who like a contest are usually welcome to join in the fun. Still to come on The Travel Show. We find out how medieval map makers in Europe saw the rest of the world. It's a kind of visual encyclopedia, but at the same time, it's really beautiful. So don't go away. Oslo is a beautiful city, but there can be some problems here if you're traveling on a budget. There's a hidden gem right around this corner, and if you look at the graffiti, you can probably figure out exactly what it is. Norway's take on the humble hot dog is known locally as pulsa. For the equivalent of just a few pounds, you get high quality hot dogs marinated in a unique broth, covered in things like mashed potato. All in a thin tortilla called a lumpa. I heard the hot dogs are a big deal in Norway. Yeah, we love hot dogs. <laughs> we are eating 450 million hot dogs and we are just five million people. <laughs> so we are eating almost 100 hot dogs each every year. Per person? Per person. That is a lot of hot dogs. Once there were well over 100 of these hot dog stands in Oslo, but since the ubiquitous convenience stores started selling them, now there's less than five left in the capital. Like this? Look at that masterpiece. Yeah, thank you. Homemade mashed potatoes, hand-picked mushrooms. We have homemade mustard and also homemade ketchup. And the main event. It's a hit. Mm, so good. Important parts of a high-quality hot dog. There's a connect, they have a word for it. The click it makes when you bite it, as well as the temperature. I'm doing a lot of talking, not a lot of eating, so I'm gonna have another bite. And if you're in Oslo, Come try one of these. Since the first camcorder was released in 1983, holiday videos have gone from a blurry Betamax grade thing you'd only show to family members to an incredible HDR 4K spectacle filmed on your smartphone and viewed by millions. This month, it's a head-to-head -head between two new cameras that could take your travel movies to the next level. The DJI Osmo Pocket and the Human Eyes Views XR. And to help me test them out, I'm bringing along my mate Tommy, AKA YouTube's Gadgets Boy. So everyone's got a smartphone, right? Which means we've essentially all got a camera in our pocket. So what would you say are some of the benefits of using something like the Osmo Pocket over your smartphone? I think for me, I don't want to carry my phone out and about with me all the time mm -hmm. because it's, it's just in your face, everyone can see it. Uh, but this is nice and compact and discreet. So I can just, I can even pop this in my pocket and, it, and just let it do its thing while I walk around and enjoy the scenery. Yeah. So I'm not always looking at my phone screen when I'm recording things. I can actually be in the moment as well. So perfect for traveling. We're putting these cameras through their paces on a speedboat ride down the Thames. So Tommy, you're armed with the Osmo Pocket. So my camera is a little bit bulkier than yours, but what's interesting about it, it's far from your average camera. So I'm looking forward to see what this thing can do. Should we cast off? Yes, please. The chief selling point of the Osmo Pocket is its three axis. 
Axis gimbal stabilization. That means video that's smoother and steadier than your average camera. Wow, this is amazing. I can actually see what I'm recording on there. It looks really stable. My arms aren't aching because it's nice and light. I think there's nothing more I can ask from a pocket camera. The Views XR also offers some stabilisation, but its big feature is 5.7K resolution 360 degree video, or when the lenses are flicked out, a virtual reality 180 degree angle. Formats which give your footage that extra bit of immersion. I know this is a quality bit of kit, but unlike the Osmo Pocket, there's no screen, which I think puts me at a, quite a disadvantage. I can pair it up to my app for a viewfinder, but I don't necessarily want two devices in my hand, so I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm losing out a little bit. It's one thing filming at a gentle speed, but how does the footage compare when the boat throttles up? So I've got a question for you. Would you use the Osmo Pocket for your YouTube videos? I really would, I definitely would. For this, uh, like when we, when we were on the boat earlier, it was very stable, uh, so stabilisation and this is amazing. And the mode on there that follows, you can follow me, so you can trap my face. So it's almost like carrying a bunch of cameramen around with yeah. me. So that's a big thumbs up from Tommy for the Osmo Pocket, but what about the Views XR? Its stabilisation might be more limited, but its 360 degree capture offers the chance for a more engaging experience. So viewing a video on a VR headset like this is pretty impressive. The high quality visuals only serves to make the footage feel more immersive while giving you an alternative and awesome option to enjoy your handy camera work. And finally, this week we head to the Cathedral City of Hereford in the southwest of England. A place that has attracted worshippers for centuries, but many have also been drawn to one of its more unique treasures, the Mappa Mundi, the largest European medieval map of the world to survive to the present day. We went to take a look. Hereford Cathedral is wonderful because it's got so many ancient treasures that weren't swept away at the Reformation or lost during the Civil War such as the Mappa Mundi, the Chained Library, and we have one of the 1217 Magna Cartas here. It's a great uh, mystery how we have the Mappa Mundi. It has the equivalent status of a World Heritage Site in a single object. Mappa Mundi is usually translated as cloth of the world. It's by far the largest medieval world map to survive. The map's got uh, pilgrim routes and trade routes that you can trace on it, but it's not primarily intended as a navigational map. Hereford is depicted on the map and it's shown more in Wales than England. And it's almost been rubbed out because over the centuries, people have put their fingers on Hereford, this is where we are. It shows lots of strange peoples and beasts on it. Some of them look very odd to us today. All sorts of people of different races, some of them depicted with dogs' heads or faces on their chest. has one or two discriminatory images. There's a not very complimentary image of Jews. There are lots of other images around the outside of the map which reflect races that people were perhaps suspicious about or didn't know anything about. But these also appear in Pliny's Natural History. So in a sense you could say that it's, it's presenting what was convention of the time. The Hereford map is most definitely a work of art. I wouldn't call them races. That's a modern 
term. They were marvelous peoples. Gains is the Latin word, people. And they demonstrated the wondrousness of God's creation. In a way, perhaps, it's a little bit like, in today's world, people saying, do little green men exist? You know, some will say, yes, there are people in outer space, yes, there are other races on other planets, and many others will say, well, no, there can't be. Uh, the Harrogate map of Mundi is just a wonderful creation in terms of its size, the skills that were used to create it, and I think it has an incredible impact when you see it for the first time. It gives you some idea of how a medieval person might have been kind of overwhelmed when they saw it. It had a huge wow factor. It's a kind of visual encyclopedia, but at the same time, it's really beautiful. The map is obviously based on Christian and the Western perspective. Jerusalem is the centre of the world. In the Middle Ages, everything was symbolism. The Christian year and the way it unfolded, it was all a vast symbol system within which people lived and, f and found meaning and direction and, and hope. Well, that's all for this week, but coming up next week. Ade is in Dubai to get a high octane supercar ride out in the desert. Oh, yes. So make sure not to miss it. Remember, you can join our adventures by following us on social media, but for now, for me, Mike Corey, and the rest of the Travel Show team here by a chilly fjord in Norway. It's goodbye.